Grazie mille um, agli organizzatori per invi avermi invitato, um, è un onore um, presentare a Bologna oggi. Um, I will switch over to English, uh, you can take your headphones off. Um, so I thought I would uh, sort of present something about my research experience researching a, um, a website um, that has uh, been pioneering um, research reusing uh, data that uh, patients report systematically over the web, which is called Patients Like Me. And uh, so my presentation is very much going to be focused uh, on the idea of uh, using personal uh, self-report data for medical research and not as much uh, for healthcare services. So in that sense, obviously, it's uh, part of the big data um, sort of ideas is uh, you can sort of, the data uses can be multiple and many. Uh, but before I start, I need to sort of also uh, clarify there's been a bit of a misunderstanding in the program. I'm not really a representative of patients like me, even if there's a sort of an affiliation to patients like me to, there, because uh, I've been contributing and collaborating with them for some time, and I was directly involved in their research and stuff. But, you know, I've never had a financial relationship or a formal relationship with the organization of any sort. So what I say is not represented, it's not the company line, but it's, it's the results of what I've been doing about them. So I will sort of uh, just uh, situate a little bit this work with the sort of broader research scope in which I'm working. Uh, I will also try to sort of say a couple of things on, you know, sort of maybe differences or relationships between what patients like me does and what could be defined as big data uh, PHRs or PHRs for big data. Um, and uh, then illustrate a, a number of core issues that I've been uh, sort of uh, uh, studying uh, in the making of patients like me. And uh, I will also close with a couple of uh, uh, issues, wider issues in, uh, especially I think of interest for uh, public administration trying to get involved in similar kinds of projects, so different requirements and situations. So um, my work on patients like me actually tracks back um, to my PhD project uh, back at uh, LSE, but uh, now it is being continued and expanded in the context of uh, a research project where we are um, together with the philosopher of data, Sabine Leonelli, and the PhD student, Gregor Hoffman. We're, um, but also with many other collaborators at the Exeter University, we're trying to uh, study sort of the implications and the social significance of uh, big data. Um, we believe that uh, the most important uh, um, consequences of big data are not too mu so much to be found in the, in the Vs because historically there's many examples, there's always been problems with volume of data in the past and data processing. So that's not very much, it's more about uh, the sort of eventual reconfigurations of division of, of labor, work practices, changes, changing methodologies and data practices. So um, we are focused on trying to understand the data journey. So what does it take for data to be reused from the originating from a context of production to uh, uh, reused in many other kinds of contexts? And what happens when they are not successfully reused? So um, it's important to sort of to, to enable big data through personal health records to think about sort of how patients that contribute data are involved in a wider sort of uh, configuration where people are sort of uh, dividing labor tasks and, and uh, trying to coordinate uh, in the sort of uh, construction of this uh, data pipeline. Um, and uh, so this can be also then compared with uh, many other, uh, um, and it builds on also di different examples that I've been studying, including uh, public health projects like the secure anonymized information link, which is sort of gets to 80% uh, coverage of uh, GP practice data together with health services and hospital data in the Wales territory. And uh, that's a public uh, health uh, uh, funded by the public uh, project and it, it, uh, it, it faces a very different and probably more restrictive constraints uh, in what can be done with the data and the format that the data can be worked on than 
uh, a project like Patients Like Me. And there's other, but I'm not going to uh, open that. Um, so this is a sort of homepage back to 2012 when uh, I was still there. And uh, um, so Patients Like Me is a website um, that counts about uh, 300,000 patients. Um, and uh, it's mainly uh, American, North American US patients. Um, 2,400 conditions, so very, very broad scope. Um, and uh, patients uh, self-report their data. They are there, as, as this slide shows, not so much or not only to contribute research data, if, even if that is one of the stated aims of the network, but for also learning from others about specific anecdotal health experiences and to socialize, also to find support, especially for uh, patients of rare, rare diseases and diseases of which the uh, epistemological status is disputed and, or controversial. Um, so there is a number of tools to track uh, health. Um, and uh, so patients are there for very different purposes and multiple pur purposes, each of them. Uh, also, patient base obviously is extremely diversified. Not only the conditions that uh, affect the life experience of the patients, but then also degrees of med medical literacy can be extremely different. Some patients are doctors themselves, and some patients instead, you know, are quote mark medically illiterate. Um, so there are important challenges in designing a, a, a website that uh, should be able to sort of. Uh, uh, objectify and uh, aggregate uh, experiences across very, very different people. And then the company, it's a company and it's a for-profit company. So uh, how this is sustained is not through the uh, advertising model of uh, mainstream social media networks. There's no advertisements, but the company takes the data and does a research for customers that are mainly um, drug companies. Uh, so, market kind of research, compar comparing drugs to one another, but also does uh, peer-reviewed research. So, they do research on patient experience, also uh, trying to compare uh, drug effectiveness. So, this is an example of a, a public profile um, of, a, of a patient of primary lateral sclerosis, so a neurodegenerative disease with no cure. Um, and uh, so, patients have got messaging features, self-representation features, profile picture about me description, uh, and so on. They've got uh, tools like Instant Me to provide a sort of a snapshot of what they feel like at the general point of view, quality of life divided in social, mental, and physical dimensions. FRS is, uh, you know, sanctioned uh, uh, patient reported outcomes measures. So uh, these are the gold standard for patient self-reporting. And then treatments. Um, accounting for uh, dates of uh, uh, taking uh, drugs or, um, or some lifestyle modifications and dosages. Um, and these can be also correlated or com you know, contrasted to um, symptoms uh, uh, by severity and duration of the symptom as well. It's important to, to, um, to uh, immediately think that uh, because the patient diversity is so extreme, then the, the, the system lives on what is called foxonomy, so uh, on user-generated categories. And that's a, a tremendous opportunity to sort of uh, uh, capture nuances that are relevant for health research, but also in a, it's an it's extreme challenge in translating knowledge, and I'll get to that in a minute. So a very, very important strategy, a very important feature for the success of this platform is uh, then to construct uh, uh, dynamically through computation and aggregation techniques a number of links that can foster social interaction with other patients. As, uh, so self-tracking and participation in research comes together with the participation in a community. So this is, for example, a report that is generated automatically on the symptom of pain. And uh, all these obviously uh, um, blue um, things are links that uh, can lead to more data and can slice through the data set in a number of ways to connect with patients. These are the most, perhaps the most, uh, you know, um, uh, 
um, evident ones. Um, so um, in this way, then, more data gen leads to more interaction, which leads to more data. It's what uh, um, cultural uh, studies uh, theorist uh, Jose van Dijk uh, calls the online sociality. And uh, um, there's, uh, this, uh, this, this actually resembles the strategies of many other networks, like Facebook, for example, and uh, features like people you may know and things like that. So, uh, patients to me as uh, big data, patient, uh, patient uh, personal health record. Well, there's, there's also obviously, we must think about the f important differences that can be found over the business model. Obviously, this is a very specific one and ways of working with the patients for self-report self data collection. Who can do what with the data? Um, and how much the data, the, the patient representation is, the patient experience is represented, and how important it is for each specific project to represent truthfully or sort of genuinely the patient uh, experience. Um, but of course, it, it, I, I imagine sort of the broader category to be involved with patient self reports of data and data reuse, and obviously the kind of issues that come with designing for distributed stakeholders. Um, so, uh, some sort of uh, general fa general question here is here in face of all these considerations, sort of what uh, uh, meanings can the data be brought uh, to sort of express, and sort of what uses can they be brought to? So we need to ask sort of what kinds of knowledges are sort of interfacing each other and how. Um, so, f some some main areas that I'm going to open up are designing for engagement of the patients and sort of information for very different people. And translation uh, of knowledge from the patient's uh, way of expressing uh, their experience to uh, what is considered uh, in sort of uh, usable or uh, the sort of the level of granularity at which health research can or um, have to, has to uh, sort of work which is a very critical and political uh, step as well. So different projects will have different sensitivity to political issues, but this is obviously a political issue. And uh, so what are the value trade-offs that are sort of uh, involved in these kinds of transactions of data and information across different parties? And, um, and uh, then problems of uh, you know, control and monopoly over data, uh, especially with these systems that uh, uh, you know, work against uh, ideas or uh, of openness. Sort of, where's the openness? Where's the closure? Uh, if uh, if one may sort of say so. So, um, taking from uh, Jacobs, uh, Le Brian scholar, sort of uh, um, understanding of uh, how classification systems uh, relate to contexts. Uh, one thing that uh, sort of I noticed is, uh, you know, what if in order to find what uh, Luciano Floridi calls the small patterns, there's, uh, you know, uh, essentially you could say two main ways. Uh, one is to increase the, num the sort of the data, uh, the size of the data pool that you have, because uh, some very small effects become visible only if you've got a lot of data. Um, if, you know, some very rare side effects of a drug, for example. Um, but also uh, increasing the specificity because the more specific is your data structure, then the more uh, information is embedded in the structure itself because you can rule out if this is A, this is not a ton of other things. Uh, so building for structure or for engagement, for specificity or for engagement often comes across purposes. And so this is something I think these kinds of projects need to think about. Um, not always, but uh, uh, if, for example, an example is the, uh, a story about arthritis, arthritis subtypes where, uh, you know, from a situation where patients could contribute their uh, patient experience against uh, subtypes of arthritis, around 20 subtypes, and the generic arthritis. Uh, that was the generic arthritis, the sort of most chosen bestseller, because lots of people, especially arthritis people, tend to be, you know, older. Um, uh, you know, maybe some memory problems or something like that. Uh, it's more difficult to recall what specific subtypes, but there's always a subtype. And interestingly, subtypes of arthritis are very different diseases from one another. So there's psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or osteoporosis. Arthritis are very different. 
So in order to, to study well arthritis, you would like to know who are, who are you as an arthritis. Uh, and so the decision was to deactivate and disallow people to say, I've got arthritis, because they had to have a subtype. And this was a trade-off because uh, it led to less data, but better data. So the, sort of my point here is uh, often this uh, trade-off is very much contingent on the research problem that uh, people have in that moment, because I've got a counterexample. And sometimes it is not necessarily a zero-sum game, because sometimes uh, there's uh, overall, over time, sort of solutions that can sort of work in, uh, improve situations in better ways. So the, web the website over its history evolved from a fixed list of symptoms to pay, giving, uh, allowing patients to give definitions of uh, symptoms and, and, and have many, but then a further improvement was to code symptom categories in the back to expert classification systems to actually allow research because it was becoming impossible to manage. So open this one up and move into the second kind of issue. Symptom reporting can be associated uh, 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 so the symptoms can be associated to treatments in two ways as a uh, reason for taking a treatment or as a side effect of it. And there's three ways to associate symptoms to uh, patients. So there's um, generic symptoms that are assigned to all patients like anxiety and pain. Um, there's condition specific symptom, uh, symptoms that uh, basically are assigned by staff, are preempted by staff and then when patients say I've got Osteoarthritis, for example, some symptoms become automatically part of the list that uh, the patients should uh, um, um, track their health against. Or otherwise, there's patients added symptoms via custom search. So, you know, textbooks searching, uh, seeing if it's already in the system. If it's already in the system, you can just pull it. Or otherwise, you can request the creation of a new symptom. And that sort of brings to a process where a professional clinician, uh, informatics nurses or pharmacists, uh, come into the picture to validate this request. So it's a very, very broad database. Uh, but to make it usable, this was a necessary step because uh, when you've got 7,000 symptoms, then you've got a lot of uh, overlapping symptoms and then again, the small patterns become invisible. So these are the steps that are involved in this uh, kind of review, and they are sort of very sensitive, obviously, because they're not always smooth transactions with patients. Patients have got their own belief about what it is their symptom and if it matters or not. So it's something to think about, and uh, obviously depending on sort of what's the decision about how broad do we want to be, how democratic do we want to be about sort of what is medical knowledge or what is patient experience that we want to host in our website. So there's a, um, this leads to sort of a third topic of, uh, to think about. Uh, there's this, these transactions is, are pretty complex and it's a pretty complex flow. Patients create and aggregate uh, data against the, these are sort of kind of, uh, that's the structure of the, it's a loose structure of the uh, data. And then there's client, client data users that also are partners, business partners with the company. They've got obviously f ways to feedback on, you know, how the data is performing to their needs. Our researchers, so they all inform developers that apply changes and these can sort of change also the way uh, this social interaction is shaped, but obviously because as I was saying, the system computes ways to interact with other people based on their conditions, the symptoms and so on. So. Uh, interesting loops and so uh, sort of there's different dimensions of value that uh, project managers need to think about. Uh, there needs to be individual value that is generated for the, for the patient. If I've got a profile that doesn't mean anything to me, it's not going to work, I'm not going to use it. Business value, uh, you know, if you can't make, sell this data or sell the projects you do with this data, obviously the, the, the system also collapses. Scientific value is also very important, uh, not only the commercial, but also the peer reviewed, because it's very important to have a legitimacy for, especially for a project like this, because patient experiences and patient self-reporting is it sort of, because has been long considered illegitimate or worthless or, you know, sort of ambiguous, uh, not very credible. 
And uh, community value because, uh, again, uh, you know, if you don't have a community, you don't have the system because these patients are there also to uh, talk to others. Then control of data. If you, if you want to uh, do big data science in the sense of do also open science, then there's the question of uh, who access these data of these uh, projects. Uh, there's, there could be reasons for close, closeness, like patient protection, because you can, if you control the users of the data, you can protect, better protect confidentiality, or also control the sort of uh, the legitimacy of the network, because you don't want people, other people, to do flaky science with your data, and sort of kill this very uh, subtle balance. But at the same time, this uh, goes against uh, ideas of openness. You maximizing the, data, the use of the data, sort of accelerating research and, and the public good in other ways. Um, so in this case, for example, this uh, system uh, uh, for a long part of its history was radically open to data collection, so share, uh, share everything you want with us, but not very open to data uses, so controlling because the whole business model is based on the monopoly of the data. Um, so Obviously, publicly funded organizations will have a very, very different uh, commitments, institutional value commitments. Uh, regulatory landscape is completely different. This is a for-profit, non-healthcare social media organization, so it's pretty easy, uh, you know, uh, from a regulation point of view. Um, so, so um, curating data again, you know, for whom, developing tools for whom, it's something that I've been seeing com coming up against also in non-patient uh, reports data projects that I'm studying, like SAIL, I was mentioning earlier, and others, sort of uh, data protection, especially if you're thinking about uh, republishing data. That's a sort of, from a frame regulatory framework point of view, it's something relatively new. It's going to basically explode your time frames if you're thinking about doing that because y there will be lots of legal uh, thought involved in sort of thinking about how to republish data. So uh, I've given also, I'm not an ethics person myself, but I've given a little bit of a contribute to sort of uh, um, a, a recent article that sort of was involved in thinking about also merging ethical concerns that are involved in sort of enabling uh, big data research with the uh, health records. And so, um, one is the changing concept of personal data, because personal data are personal for more than one person. A genetic sequence about myself is also uh, often about my parents, for example, or my brother. So if I give consent or not about you know, uh, providing information, once my genetic sequence gets, you know, gets uh, functionally interpreted and there is some imp relevant implications, should I be able to decide for others that are not me? about whether they should be warned, they should know about these implications. That's the question. Limits on anonymization, and the more you link, and the more sort of anonymizing demographic data becomes completely useless. So uh, that's the sort of idea of big data. It goes in the face of sort of protecting, um, uh, obviously, confidentiality. Uh, Broad consent, now informed consent is broken, but broad consent is unclear because when you in broad consent or blanket consent, any future uses, it means basically anything, and the future uses can be so many, so obviously something. Um, also, what is health data? Because, uh, you know, as uh, there's a ton of examples about uh, how much you can tell about health of, the, of people uh, based on their search engine queries. And, is, so is that health data, should that be regulated uh, through health data? Should that be linkable or linked according to what regulatory framework? And so on. And, uh, and also then predictive analytics, obviously they're often black boxed, you don't know how they work and stuff, so what kind of uh, protections should be there when you go into sort of real time uh, big data and so on. So uh, to summarize sort of uh, important issues I think for Projects like these we are concerned with today are designing for engagement in the face of radical patient diversity. Uncertainties and politics of uh, these uh, knowledge and translation systems. And so then sort of uh, creating value for whom and how, what are the expectations. Um, control of data, obviously. So what's sort of your commitment to openness and, and, uh, and uh, versus protection and these emerging ethical challenges. 
But uh, thanks very much. Grazie infinite.